from All About Coins. Um, so tell me how you got, this is such an eclectic, interesting story because you got rare bottles, rare coins, rare stones. You got coins that go all the way back to Julius Caesar. And before. And before. And, yeah. and it's Alexander just the Great. really an interesting shop because it's hard to collect a lot of things and do a really good job because you really need to know so much yeah. about your specific area, but you've been in this business for 40 some odd years. How did yeah. you how did you develop the mind to be a collector and how do you, so many people want to make a business out of it, how did sure. you turn it into your, your income? And Hobby to a business, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, I get it. Um, well, I need to maybe say some of my credentials. Uh, I have a PhD in numismatics. I've testified in front of the United States Senate. I've been president of the American Numismatic Association, the largest coin organization in the world, chartered by Congress in 1912. It's the only hobby group it is. Our charter is to actually give out information to the hobby, you know, about counterfeits and alterations on coins, and then the history behind them that's correct and things like that. So it's, it's kind of a neat little uh, well, it's not little, it's big, you know. And uh, you got your PhD in it from where? Yeah, well, they actually, it's, I should say, I'm, I'm uh, it's an PhD. Okay. <laughs> but I was on Colorado College in Colorado Springs. That's where our headquarters is from them. And the, the association, the Numer American Numismatic uh, Association, the School of Numismatics presented me that with that. Um, but it, it seems like you really, I mean, all these books behind you, more than that, you got to be able to detect fake coins. Yep. Mark Hoffman made this his yep. home and was a master yep. order. I, I knew Mark Hoffman really well. Uh, I was, I was one of those people who thought he was innocent up until he confessed. So, you know, I, I look at myself then and wasn't as smart as I thought I was. Well, obviously, he, he, he got everybody though. I mean, yeah. the LDS Church and oh, Young Rust was. Oh yeah, and everybody wanted to try to detect the church and come to the rescue and. He played on that. He's, he's a lot smarter. He's he's in who's who, and it means a big deal to him to still keep his um, listing in there as with an IQ above 160 that he's a genius type of thing. Mm -hmm. So how do you detect fraudulent coins? I mean, that's well, got to um, be extreme. The number one best way is by comparing it with another. So by just constantly looking back and forth, and if you have a ratchety mind like me, I look for small details and flaws. I'm, I'm really a, a builder's nightmare because I can see flaws in everything. And, uh, but comparison is the number one best way. There's certain things that um, a person that counterfeits coins, so they're gonna always take shortcuts on what the mint does. So in these shortcuts, they make mistakes. They don't realize, and again, they're only trying to fool somebody maybe for face value with things that are just contemporary to then numismatics with somebody that isn't that smart. So the, their only thing is they have to fool you for a short time. You know, so we're constantly doing this. I'm actually an instructor with that School of Numismatics. I, I teach multiple classes. The, the class that I think is actually the hardest there as I teach, and that's counterfeit and alteration and detection on United States coins. You teach I, the class. I teach the class. Wow. I've oh. taught more federal officers than anybody else has ever been an instructor of the class, and I'm a senior instructor. So I, I've taught mostly Secret Service agents, but I've also taught tre Treasury agents, IRAs, IRS, uh, what I call Criminal Investigation Unit. I've taught to MIN employees and taught them, and also Customs, Border Patrol, Homeland Security, U.S. Marshal Service. I've taught more federal agents than everybody together. And we're currently, our projects right now, we have things that are seized at ports that are counterfeits that are coming from China and we have huge quantities. And they w went from making everything US and kind of we, we kind of joke about it, but the Chinese government has allowed people over to make coins. They actually have 130% of everything that US has made. In other words, 30% stuff they've just dreamed up. They put the wrong dates and mint marks together. The coins don't even exist what they've made up. You know, so there's a real problem with that. But there's also a real problem about their recently just made coins to pass uh, a coin counting machine. So they can make a, a quarter dollar, you know, a 25 cent piece for quite a bit less than what the US Mint can make it. And they can make it in a way that the current counting machines won't detect it. No way. Yeah, so we've- The Chinese are doing that. We can prove that, yeah. Wow. 
but this is something I probably should say this because I'm involved with these cases, but there's counterfeit coins and change right now that are just being spent. You know, the U.S. government doesn't want to release that in a factual form, but we can, science is all about it, and we can actually prove that they are counterfeit. Well, I, I did They're not a, even round. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like I, I did a sort of a deep dive into Mark Hoffman and his forgeries, and mm -hmm. a lot of his forgeries are still out there, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah. You, like, you just can't detect yeah. all of it because he got so good at it. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realize that his forgeries weren't all with the Mormon church and things like that. More than half of them had to do with early American history. In fact, uh, his downfall was trying to always cover up and selling something and rebuying it from that person for a lot of money. And that person would say, I made a lot of money. And then the next time he'd be fine, even with more of an expensive item. Mm -hmm. Sorry for the doorbell. Sorry. But, uh, you know, it's a constant thing like that that we're trying to do. So in one of my classes taught, the only one that's really taught yeah. at, a, at a, you know, college level, we have other classes that are about grading and uh, a myriad of different ones. The other class I talk about is um, oxidation, thin film interference, the color and toning on points. How do you can tell the artificial from the natural? You know, and there's what we call coin doctors out there, demon Michelangelo's. They're always trying to pull third party grading services into grading a coin for its originality when it was, wasn't original. So these classes I teach are all about science. In our, in our particular coin field, grading is a big part of it. You know, determining the grade, higher the grade usually means more in the value. So grading is artistic interpretation, not a fact or science. It's just what somebody believes to be that. And two so-called experts might be able to prove their point and still get different grades coming up. With it. So grading is not a scientific process. But we do a lot of different things in these classes. That we offer seminars, and it goes over two weeks. And I teach on the second week with these two different classes at different times, one so during the day and one during the night. So back to the, to the business of specie and, and bullion. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, you name it, we probably deal with it. But we really like unusual things to handle, too. But how I got started here is an interesting story. So my father died before I was five. He had rheumatic fever as a son, developed scar tissue on his valve in his heart. And he died, and uh, Russell M. Nelson was his actual doctor. So he, the president of the church, the prophet that we have downtown, he was the last man to see my, my father alive. I'd love to talk to him about it, but I think he's too busy. But anyway, uh, so when I grew up without a dad, you know, my mom was a, an immigrant, you know, she was from Finland, didn't speak the English language very good, and she was raising four kids. It was really hard. We grew up really poor, but so I took a liking to anything that my dad liked. And I know my dad had a little small collection of these blue, what we call Whitman folders, and I would look through them. If there was a box that he had. It was white, about this big, and in it had crown-sized coins from around the world. Those are silver dollar size, you know, about an inch and a half. And I would study them and learn about them, and I would be fascinated by them. And of course, I grew up in a time where you could go get a bag of pennies from the bank and look through them and look for the older dates and, and fill up collections like that. I was so excited to, to learn these things. And in my own way, it was like honoring my father by getting to know him by what he did in his life. So to me, I feel like I'm honoring my father. My father was later a jeweler. I was a bench jeweler for a good part of my life, too, when I was going to BYU. I put my way through school by making a lot of engagement rings. It's a, it's a rich environment, you know, and everybody wants to get married down there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I did a lot of work for faculty, and I worked for three different shops and, and things like that. But we have our jewelry department, which we have a really vintage jewelry and uh, jewelry that we refurbish. And, you know, 70% of everything that we sell in that respect here goes to other dealers. And we sell it not with that jewelry store markup, but really a real bargain. You don't need a friend, you just need somebody that's honest. <laughs> that can say this is what the real truth is. You know, and uh, cool. but we, we like to do that. And, and then when I was 11, I actually formed my first coin club in my neighborhood. It was just four of us in it. You know, and uh, I was president, of course. <laughs> and we would get that bag of pennies on our bicycles and ride between banks. and. It was comical sometimes, you know, and you go to the bank and you ask the teller for a bag of pennies, and you got one, you pop it up right in front of us, and says, I would like to get a bag of pennies, and she would go, 
you have a bag of pennies. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 we look through them, we look for all the dates. So you get we a $10 bill, they give you. Yeah, $10. they'd be in rolls, and we'd had a mark on the rolls, so we didn't see them twice. And then a 10 mile area around, and you know, I wouldn't even let my kids ride my bike 10 miles like, like that now, but we did, you know, and that's how it was. And by the time I was 15, I started buying and selling coins between dealers. I would find mistakes that they made in grading, and I could buy it for one, sell it for a profit to another one. And I, How I would you identify that. those grading mistakes? Just by learning, you? reading books. I'm a prolific reader. I have three different libraries, you know. I have probably 1,200 books. Just and you can just habits. tell that they made yeah. a mistake on the value. Yeah, the grading. And yeah. Wow, that's Sometimes amazing. their attribution is wrong, too, and things like that. I was known as Bobby the Whiz Kid when I was young. So I could do this, and I would go to another shop, and they would look at my box of coins that I had and buy things from me. And, of course, I'd be looking through their shop and looking for coins that I could make more money because I knew one person would pay more for it than the other and things like that. And I remember one dealer one time says, uh, says, Bobby, you're still hanging around here. Did you want to look at some more stuff or did you have some more stuff to tell, to show me? And I said, no, I, I, I can't. I, I have to wait for my mom to give me a ride. I can't drive. <laughs> <laughs> but I can deal in coins. And I became a professional numismatist, you know, a, a, a Latin word person who studies money. Know, collects coins and uh, when I was 22 I was professional and I would go to coin shows and everything and you know life's been really good to me. I've had a, a lot of awards. I've written 11 books. Uh, I'm writing several still and uh, I don't know if I have the time. I got too much information in my head. I want to get it out of my head. You know and uh, uh, a lot of people consider me one of the 10 top newest in the country. So.